everyone and welcome to the fifth meeting of the European and External Relations Committee in session five. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and ensure that they don't interfere with the broadcasting equipment and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should please ensure that they are switched to silence. Uh, no apologies have been received today. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, are members agreed? Agreed. Agenda item two is the EU referendum and its implications for Scotland. And today we are taking evidence from the First Minister. Um, our main item of business uh, today, and I'd like to welcome the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, to the committee, and Karen Watt, the Director of External Affairs with the Scottish Government. Um, can I first invite the First Minister to make an opening statement? Uh, indeed, Convener, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to update the committee on the work of the Scottish Government since the referendum on the 23rd of June. It won't surprise anybody in the committee to hear me say that I remain profoundly concerned about the implications of Brexit. I know we are now hearing some voices saying that uh, because the sky hasn't fallen in so far, it's all going to be fine. I think that is a deeply, uh, deeply misguided view. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that Brexit hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even uh, started. Uh, when it does and when the implications of it start to hit home, I, I think the impact on the economy, on jobs, trade, investment, on our universities, on the lives of EU nationals uh, living here, on British citizens living in other EU countries are likely to be severe. Uh, how severe, of course, will depend on the type of Brexit that we are uh, looking at and what the future relationship with the European Union is likely to be. Um, and while there are precious few answers to those questions from the UK government at this stage, uh, I think it's fair to say the early signs uh, are not encouraging. All of that, in my view, would be bad enough, but it is made worse by the fact that Scotland didn't vote to leave the European Union. A majority of those in Scotland who voted, of course, voted to remain, and that's why... I'm so determined that the Scottish Government will explore all options to protect Scotland's interests. Uh, over the summer, I set out what I uh, see those interests as being, our democratic and economic interests, our interests in social protection and solidarity, and of course our interest in continuing to have influence in terms of the, uh, the world we live in. Uh, in terms of how we will seek to uh, protect Scotland's interests. Uh, I've made clear that we will uh, seek to embed ourselves as firmly as we possibly can in the UK process of developing its negotiating strategy. I'm more than happy, obviously, to update the committee as we go through this session on uh, where we've got to in uh, that effort. Then, in terms of how we'll uh, seek to use our influence, uh, as I set out to the Chamber last week, uh, firstly, we will seek to make common cause with those of like mind across the UK to try to reach the, the least worst outcome for the UK as a whole. In my view, in my very strong view, that means remaining within the single market. Uh, there is a lot of conflation uh, at the moment between membership of the single market and access to the single market. These are two very different things, and I think membership of the single market is important. Secondly, we'll seek to explore differential options uh, for Scotland and our Standing Council of Experts is already working on a spectrum of options and again I can talk in more detail about that later on uh, and thirdly and lastly of course we will make sure that the option of independence remains open if we do conclude that it is simply not possible to protect Scotland's interests uh, within the UK. Uh, so that's a, a very brief summary of where we stand at the moment. Clearly there will be a lot of detail that the committee wants to go into. Um, I think right now we are at the start of what is likely to to be a very long and perhaps a very tortuous process. Um, and as I've said uh, previously, as I said to the Chamber last week, as we navigate our way through that process, uh, then protecting Scotland's interests will be the guiding principle uh, that the Scottish Government operates by. Uh, and I'm happy to expand on that and any of the other brief comments I've made so far. Thank you very much, First Minister. Um, can I start off, um, when the Prime Minister visited you in Edinburgh in July, she said she wouldn't trigger Article 50 until there was a UK-wide approach. And if I can quote her, she said, we've discussed the up-and-coming EU negotiations and I'm very clear that I want the Scottish Government to be fully involved. Now, that was almost exactly two months ago. Can I ask whether you believe that there has been a UK-wide approach so far, uh, given Scotland's Remain vote, and whether the Scottish Government has actually been fully involved in any negotiations that Mrs May promised would happen? 
Well, you've accurately quoted uh, the Prime Minister uh, on the occasion when she came to Edinburgh uh, shortly after she took office. Um, what we've been doing uh, in the intervening period is trying to turn that commitment, that very clear commitment that she gave me and then uh, narrated publicly, into reality. So there has been extensive discussions, these are ongoing, between Scottish Government officials and UK Government officials about what the process will look like that will ensure that the Scottish Government and other devolved administrations are meaningfully engaged. Now, as I say, those discussions are ongoing. Uh, they are uh, not proceeding as quickly as I would like them to, but I hope we will see some progress in the next few days. Uh, Mike Russell is going to London to meet with David Davis tomorrow, uh, and I would hope there would be some uh, multilateral uh, meeting taking place in October involving all of the devolved administrations. Um, obviously, I'll keep the committee uh, fully updated as, as those discussions conclude. Uh, a couple other points just to, to make there. I, I, I said this in the Chamber uh, last week. I want the Scottish Government to be fully and meaningfully engaged in this process, principally from now until Article 50 is triggered, because that's when the, the UK's negotiating strategy will formulate, but obviously will require to be involved after that as well. What I'm not prepared uh, to do, though, is, is allow the Scottish Government to be used, as the phrase I used last week was, was window dressing in some kind of talking shop. Uh, we want to be engaged in a way that gives us input into the decision making, not just uh, treated as another consultee. And that's a, a view that I know is shared by the First Minister of Wales, who, when the British Irish Council met in the summer, uh, said that you know, he thought there was an argument for the parliaments in different parts of the UK to have a, a say before Article 50 is triggered. So I think, while I can't speak for the other devolved administrations, I think there is a, a common view that uh, we're not just going into a process to be consulted. Uh, we want to be uh, part of the decision making. That's what the discussions that we're engaged in just now are trying to achieve. Um, as I say, they've not concluded yet, uh, but as soon as they do, uh, or when there is any uh, further material developments, I'll make sure the committee is fully advised of that. Thank you very much. If I could just drill, drill down on that. I wondered if you, if there had been a, a, a change of, of tone from the UK government, because I noted that the Scottish Secretary, David Mundell, recently gave a television interview in which he seemed to be backing away from Mrs May's uh, reassurances and insisting that the UK government was very much uh, in the lead in this matter. And I just wondered what your reflections on that. Was he perhaps expressing a personal opinion uh, like his <laughs> colleagues Liam Fox and David Davis? It seems to be the end thing at the moment. Look, I, I, I'm not genuinely not sure. I'm, I'm not just trying to, to, to be pejorative here or, or, you know, be party political. I'm genuinely not sure um, that we can read too much on a day-to-day -to -day basis into whatever minister of the UK government happens to be speaking on any particular day. I think we saw that very clearly last week in terms of uh, David Davis's comments that were immediately disavowed by the Prime Minister and similarly with Liam Fox's comments uh, at the weekend. There is, uh, at this stage, and you know, I'm, I'm not just talking here about the process of how these things will develop, but much more uh, pertinently in terms of the substance of some of the positions, I think, uh, if I can put it politely, a, a rather underdeveloped uh, UK government position. Now, uh, we are seeking to try to get to a point of agreement on the process. I am, as I say, I've you know, been frustrated about the fact that that has not been moving more quickly. Uh, I hope it does uh, conclude over the next few days. And then if we have a process which will be a mixture of a, a bilateral stream involving direct discussions between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in terms of us bringing forward uh, our views on the, the interests that are at stake and also our views on perhaps different options for Scotland, but also a, a multilateral process that will involve all of the devolved administrations. But it must be meaningful, uh, and I can't stress that point enough. There are other aspects that we will no doubt get into about the UK Government's position just now that I think have got to change. I, I think the lack of uh, any answers to basic questions about what the UK government is actually seeking to achieve, you know, three months on from the referendum is just you know, unacceptable and becomes more unacceptable with every day that passes. And also this idea that there can be, you know, a, a cloak of secrecy over uh, the, the position of the UK government as it develops, I, I just think is untenable. So I hope we start to see much more detail and much more definition from the UK government uh, before too much uh, longer. Right. Before I hand over to my colleague Lewis MacDonald, then, there has been a, a recent quite significant intervention in the, the issue in that the House of Lords uh, Constitution Committee um, has said that it believes that um, 
Parliament and Westminster Parliament should be involved uh, in triggering uh, Article 50 and that the royal prerogative is, is not enough and that's obviously very different from the position that the Prime Minister has taken. What, what's your view on that and in terms of um, the, if, as, you, as you're aware there is also legal action around this issue. If it was the case that this had to go to the House of Commons. What do you think the role of the Scottish Parliament should be, for example, should there be an LCM? Well, well, let me unpack that a little bit, um, because there's a, a couple of stages to that. Um, I, obviously, I read the, the report of the House of Lords uh, yesterday, and there are uh, legal actions that have been raised in England, and also a legal action has been raised in Northern Ireland. Um, I, I think the expectation, um, although I'm obviously not privy to the decision-making around any of this, but the expectation is that one or both of these legal actions will, will end up in the Supreme Court. Um, now, as I understand it, the argument at the heart of these actions is that because uh, our membership of the European Union is, uh, was delivered by statute, the 1972 Act, um, and because a triggering of Article 50 would trigger a process that would, to all intents and purposes, nullify the 1972 Act, then that triggering of that process cannot be done by the royal prerogative. It would have to be done by an Act of Parliament. Other otherwise, you would have a situation where, by executive action, you could effectively overturn primary legislation. Now, that's what I understand is, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but that's the, the argument at, at the heart of these actions. Um, now... Uh, this is not a legal view, obviously, this is just my, my personal view. Uh, that sounds to me pretty compelling. So I think there is uh, an issue here that you know, may well come to the fore in terms of the role of, of Parliament. And we may well, I, obviously I have no inside knowledge on this, but we may well get to a stage where we have a, a court decision that says Parliament has to be involved in, in that way. I should say the Scottish Government is keeping a very close eye on these court actions and, and will assess as, as they proceed uh, at, at all stages whether or not there's an argument for us to become more directly involved to make sure the interests of the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament are, are protected. Um, if that was to be the case, that there was a decision, and I'm, I'm obviously speculating now, that, that Parliament had to uh, pass legislation, that brings the issue of an LCM into sharp focus. And again, as I understand it, the Northern Irish action is very much about uh, the, the need or otherwise for an LCM in the Northern Irish context. Uh, and, you know, it would be that argument that would give the Scottish Government potentially an interest in this as it, it develops. Um, I think if there is uh, going to be House of Commons legislation, my view would be that would require an LCM, and I, I think, therefore, the, the views of the Scottish Parliament become uh, very central to that. Now, as I say, I'm talking here about a legal uh, action. Um, I hope we get to a position, notwithstanding any legal action, where... Uh, the, the commitment that you've already quoted from the Prime Minister that the Scottish Government and the other devolved administrations will have a meaningful role in this, effectively part of the decision-making framework, uh, will mean you know, that for us that is, is more of a, the, the legal action is more of a moot point, but nevertheless these are really important issues uh, and are just part of the, the many issues that are at play just now which uh, makes me think that the, the road ahead, uh, rather than becoming uh, less complicated uh, as we move on from the, the referendum result, actually become you know, more complicated a whole, across a whole range of different areas. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Lewis MacDonald now. Thank you very much, First Minister. I take it from what you described that the meeting between Michael Russell and David Davis tomorrow will be the first ministerial uh, meeting to discuss this since your own meeting with the Prime Minister some time ago. If that's the case, can you tell us what official contact there's been uh, at senior civil servant level between the two governments about the basis of discussions going forward and the basis on which the UK intends to take forward negotiations? I have uh, had, uh, not long after he was appointed, telephone conversation with David Davis, so tomorrow's meeting will not be the first discussion, it will be the first ministerial uh, meeting in, in the way that, that, that you describe. Um, there is extensive and has been extensive uh, discussions between our respective civil servants. These are ongoing. Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government is involved in these. Uh, Karen uh, Watt, as the, the relevant director, is involved. Uh, Ken Thompson, uh, one of our other uh, DGs, uh, is, is involved. And those discussions are, have been intensive as we try to, to use the shorthand I used earlier on, turn the Prime Minister's commitment into a, 
a mutually agreed and understood process. Now, as I say, those discussions are ongoing um, and therefore I can't tell you what the c concluding point of them is yet, uh, but we are looking at developing uh, a, a, a process of bilateral discussion between the, the Scottish Government and the UK Government, but also this multilateral uh, process where we have a, a, a forum for all of the devolved administrations to feed directly into the process. I understand that you're not at the point of conclusions. Are you at the point where you can say uh, to us today that those uh, discussions have made progress and that we're um, getting to the point where we can see uh, the future shape beginning to take I, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm optimistic and I think, uh, and, and I hope the meeting between Mike Russell and David Davis will move them on uh, even further tomorrow. Um, that said, when I made my statement to Parliament last week, I probably hoped then that by today we would have uh, had a conclusion in these discussions. So without overstating this, they're, they're not progressing. Maybe I'm just being impatient, but with good reason. They're not progressing quite as quickly as I would have liked them to. Um, but yes, I think they are making progress. And I am at this stage optimistic that they will conclude soon. And I'm optimistic that they'll conclude in a form that enables the Scottish Government in good faith to go into a process that allows us to have our voice meaningfully heard. I'm, I'm encouraged that one of the endpoints you see potentially coming is a multilateral engagement with the other devolved administrations. Clearly, Wales and Northern Ireland will be at that table. Can you tell me if your expectation is that the Mayor of London will be at that table, given the particular London perspective and all this? I, I'm, I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not going to to try and speak for the Mayor of London, he'll be having his own discussions, but this, uh, you know, we're talking here about the devolved administrations um, and, and the, the discussions that would take place there. I, I certainly would be, you know, very happy to have the Mayor of London fully involved. He has, in many respects, got some of the, the same concerns that, that I have about Brexit and, you know, I've had very good discussions uh, with him since the, the EU referendum. Uh, you know, the, the Crown dependencies, although they don't uh, take they are involved in the British Irish Council, which will also be an important forum, I think, as we go through this process. They uh, have obviously different relationships with the European Union, but are very centrally uh, affected by this decision, and, and Gibraltar, of course. Um, and I've, I've met with the Chief Minister of, of Gibraltar since the referendum as well. So there'll be different forums in which different uh, players, if I can use that term, will, will participate. Um, you know, obviously what I've been talking about so far has been uh, related to the, the devolved administrations. And presumably therefore in the format of a joint ministerial council. As that's not, exists. I mean, that is not finally no. agreed yet, but you know, that's the kind of uh, framework that I would hope we, we would get to the point of agreeing. Thank you very much. Um, was it in this subject, uh, Richard Lockhead? Uh, well, the negotiations of the options, I'm not sure. It's <laughs> kind of, yeah. Well, I'll bring you in and then um, Jackson Carlo. Thanks. In terms, uh, good, good morning or good afternoon, First Minister. In terms of the Scottish Government's negotiations with the, the UK Government, clearly the Scottish Government's position is that all options should be explored to continue a relationship with Europe, particularly access to the single market or membership of the single market. Uh, therefore, in terms of those options, that would require either the UK Government to pick up Scotland's demands and negotiate them with EU institutions and other member states, or to give blessing for Scotland to deal directly with the EU institutions and other member states. Is there any indication so far that the Prime Minister is willing to use either of those two routes? Um, well, firstly, you uh, rightly uh, put your finger on why we are viewing this process of developing the UK's negotiating strategy uh, with the importance we are, because if we want to make sure Scotland's interests are protected in this uh, process, then we have to make sure that we are embedded into to that process. I think, though, you know, I've just been answering questions about the fact that we are still discussing the process by which we're going to do this. So, you know, it would be wrong to say that we are yet at the stage where we're into the substantive discussion about, you know, what that position might be and therefore what Scotland's particular asks in that might be. Obviously, we're doing work on our own part through the, the Standing Council of Experts to develop what those options would be and, and what options we might want to, to put into uh, or onto the table in that process. Some of that, you know, will obviously depend on which way the UK government decides to go in terms of what it's seeking to achieve. Uh, so we're at a very, very early stage of this. And, you know, in some ways, it's, it's gobsmacking to use hopefully not non-parliamentary language, that we are at such an early stage. We're three months on from 
uh, the referendum where basic questions about what the UK government is seeking to achieve aren't been answered in or out of the single market. You know, I've just, uh, on my way through here, caught uh, part of Prime Minister's questions where the question, you know, do, do we think we should continue to seek visa-free access to the European Union? No answer to that question. I remember all too well in the independence referendum being pressed not just for Plan A, but Plan B, C, D, E, right through to Z on every single issue. And here we are, three months after a referendum, and the UK government doesn't even have Plan A. It is absolutely breathtaking. Right. Jackson. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, First Minister. Um, of course, uh, having said that the, the Prime Minister, having said that she wants to involve the devolved administrations meaningfully in the discussions that take place, were she to be unilaterally announcing positions now, it might be taken that that had not given proper place to the devolved administrations to have contributed to whatever that position happens to be. But I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, slightly following on from what Richard Lockhead was about events over the summer and also the committee's visit to Brussels. Now, in your statement last week, um, I think you made mention of having met three of the EU member state heads of government. Um, the Prime Minister, I, I think, spoken and met them all. And, and that's just a function, I imagine, of the fact that the Prime Minister is the head of the member state, the United Kingdom, uh, in the discussions that are taking place. What kind of conclusions have you drawn or thoughts have you evolved about how Scotland can uh, engage with EU member states, given the kind of protocols that you know currently exist, which perhaps inhibit member states from feeling that they are able to meaningfully engage with the Scottish government directly. Okay, um, just one one point on you, the, the first part of your uh, or the, the preamble to your question. I, I, there would be no objection from me, and while I can't speak for them, I can't imagine there would be much objection from the first ministers of, of Wales or even. Uh, Northern Ireland, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, took a different view on the referendum than, than I did. I can't imagine any of us would object if the, if the Prime Minister was to say, now, yes, I want the UK to stay in the single market. So I, I don't see there's any sort of, uh, you know, uh, barrier to, to basic questions like that being answered. And, you know, I think sooner or later, hopefully sooner, those kind of questions are going to have to be answered. Except it could become an extended list. Well, we, you know, I, I think three months on, I think some very basic questions uh, shouldn't still be the blank sheet of paper that they, they are right now. Um, in terms of uh, your question about protocols, I have to say I, I've not found uh, the people we've been speaking to in, in Europe, either in the institutions or in member states, and in addition to my discussions, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for External Affairs has been meeting uh, representatives of, of a number of member states at uh, Ambassador or Consul General uh, level. Uh, there's no great inhibition in terms of speaking to the Scottish Government. There's, uh, you know, been a very warm and open door approach to the the, the Scottish Government. Um, what there also is, though, is is a recognition, and I, you know, have always readily accepted this, that when Article 50 is triggered the negotiation is going to be between the European Union and the UK government, which is why it's so important that our voice is heard in the development of that position. And I guess the, the inhibition that I have uh, well, detected, it's, it's very openly said, is that there is, there is a, a, an inability to engage in that just now before the UK government comes and says what its position is and actually triggers uh, that process. So if there's any inhibition that I'm picking up from uh, European Union level, it's because they don't know what the UK government is asking for and therefore, you know, how can they have a meaningful discussion about what their position might be on that. But in terms of the approach to Scotland and the, uh, the response to Scotland, uh, and remember, in these discussions, we're not yet at the position of, of asking for anything. This is about raising awareness and, you know, making sure Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government's position is, is understood. Um, and there has been a receptiveness and a warmth and a willingness uh, to see the view of Scotland uh, honoured and respected as far as, uh, as that can be, be possible. So I've yeah. been very encouraged by it so far. And just a final point following that up. Yes, I think when we met uh, EU ambassadors from member and other states, uh, there was the recognition that there can be a distinctive representation of Scotland's position with any uh, final agreement that is arrived at, and that member states would wish, if they could, to participate in those discussions directly, but that that would be conditional upon the lead member state, the UK, uh, consenting to that. Otherwise, I think the expression that was used was shutters could come down. Um, they felt that was conditional upon the sincerity and 
non-partisan engagement in which the Scottish Government and I suppose the other devolved administrations actually enter into the discussions that are going to take place. And I suppose at the heart of this, there is always the political argument that you addressed right at the start of your remarks about Scotland taking a different view from the rest of the United Kingdom and you wishing to represent that. How do you square that circle to ensure that in forcing the point that I think you wish to make, it doesn't compromise uh, the UK in any way um, subsequently saying that they're not comfortable with the rest of the European Union member states having those kind of engagements that might lead to those differentials in any settlement that's finally arrived at. I'm, I'm trying to keep track with where you, <laughs> you ended up there. Um, you know, I, I hope we don't get to a situation where the, the UK government is, is saying that it's not comfortable with the Scottish government representing its interests at European level. And to be fair to the, the UK government, and I'm not just talking in uh, a Brexit uh, context here, you know, there has been a, a, an understanding and a respect for the fact that the Scottish government engages with other governments in a whole range uh, of issues. And I would hope that would continue in, in all circumstances. Um, you, you asked me how I square the circle. I, so far, in terms of the discussions I've been having, I'm doing that by being perfectly straight with people. I don't think I'm, I'm betraying any secrets to tell people that I'm somebody who believes Scotland should be independent. I've always believed that, and uh, I still believe that. But as I said immediately after the, the referendum in June, um, I, I am not taking that as my starting point in the, the post-Brexit discussions. Uh, I believe uh, that Scotland's interests, actually, I think the UK's interests are, are compromised and damaged by Brexit, uh, but I'm the First Minister of Scotland. I believe Scotland's interests are damaged and compromised, and therefore my starting point is how do I find a way of, as best I can, protecting those interests? Um, and that's why you know, I'm very clear. I, I want to see if we can make common cause with others across the UK. Hopefully you'd be on the same side on this, Jackson, although I don't know, of saying, look, let's try and keep the UK in the single market, because that's not as good, in my view, as being full members of the European Union, but it's, it's not as bad an option as some of the other options, having simply access on the basis of a free trade agreement with the single market or uh, World Trade Organization rules. So I'm taking that very uh, interest-driven uh, approach to it. Uh, the difference between you and I is that because I am being driven by Scotland's interests, I'm not prepared to rule out certain options that may be necessary to protect those interests. And that approach uh, in the discussions I've had so far has been met uh, very, very warmly. And, you know, I campaigned very hard, as did many people uh, around this table, uh, and made the argument for the whole UK to stay within mm -hmm. the European Union. So this is something that is not being driven um, by, you know, my own views on, you know, the constitutional future of Scotland. It's about how do we protect our economic and other interests in the best possible way. And that's the principle that I will continue to, to be guided by throughout this entire process. Thank you. Um, Ross Greer and then Emma Harper. Thanks, Convener. Uh, First Minister, you've highlighted that the UK government has hinted at a particular form of Brexit, which we would collectively regard as certainly being against Scotland's interests. Does the Scottish Government have any criteria which, if the terms of Brexit fail to meet them, would mandate a second independence referendum? Well, I set out at uh, a, a high level the interests that uh, we will seek to uh, assess different options against. So, you know, our democratic interests, our economic interests, social protection, solidarity and influence. These were the five interests I set out. Now, obviously, Underneath all of these, there will be much more detailed um, assessments that we will require to do, and that's part of the work that we are doing as we are uh, working across the whole of government to assess the impact on uh, different sectors. Um, and again, as that work develops, this committee will have an interest in, in scrutinising and, uh, and overseeing that work. Um, I've said all along, and I've, I've been absolutely clear about this, and you know, it will be the difference between us, I, I assume, and, and some others around this table. I believe that as, as part of a, a process that is driven by how do we protect Scotland's interests, we've got to have the option if, if we get to a point where we cannot protect our interests within the UK because the UK is heading for a hard Brexit that you know, denies our financial services industry passporting rights, that has our exporters uh, having to jump over all sorts of hurdles to sell their goods in European markets, that has our universities locked out of Horizon 2020, our students locked out of Erasmus, that has restrictions on free movement that damage our economy. 
if we end up in that kind of position, then I think it would be wrong to deny people in Scotland the right to consider whether independence is a better way of protecting uh, those interests. But, you know, as I said to Jackson, that's not the starting point. I am going to methodically uh, and systematically work through all of the options. Some of them will, you know, have to be explored in parallel to see how we best protect those interests. And that, as I, I keep saying, is the guiding principle uh, that I'll continue to have in mind. Thanks. To explore that hypothetical slightly, uh, what cooperation would you expect from the UK government if that were to happen, both for the referendum itself and potential direct Scottish negotiations with the European Union? Um, well, I think we're, we're not at the stage yet where I could say what position I think the UK government would take when, when, if and when we got there. I think I'd be getting several steps ahead of myself. Obviously, I can say I hope we'd have a, a cooperative and a constructive uh, approach from the UK government, uh, but that's uh, perhaps more hope over uh, expectation uh, at this stage. Uh, but, you know, these are things we have to work uh, our way through. And, you know, I, I, you know, and I know people uh, in different political parties will, you know, maybe raise an eyebrow when I say this, but I hope they won't. I, if, if we can get to a conclusion of the the discussions around the process that I've talked about, we will go into this in good faith, trying to examine all options to protect our interests. I actually do believe that the, the whole of the UK will be better served by remaining within the single market. So if we can be uh, part of a, uh, you know, a coalition of interests across the UK, a, a progressive alliance, let's call it, uh, where we can make that case for continued single market membership, then we will do that. Obviously, if that's not going to be possible, we have to explore different options up to and including the independence option. And what I would say about the UK government is I hope uh, that they would respect the views of the Scottish people. Um, obviously, with independence, that would depend ultimately on the views of the Scottish people. But I hope there'll be a respect for the views of the, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people. Uh, what we should never forget in all of this debate, and I know it's going to harken back, but it is... It's a pertinent point that, you know, people in Scotland, when they voted in the independence referendum, were told that voting no was the way to secure our European Union membership. And here we are two years later with our European uh, Union membership in real jeopardy because uh, we're not independent. Thanks very much. Emma and then Rachel Hamilton. OK, thank you, convener. Um, thank you, First Minister, for coming today. Um, you spoke recently at the Institute for Public Policy Research about the UK being headed for a hard Brexit and whether we establish negotiations through a joint ministerial council grouping or whatever interministerial arrangement. Um, can you see these negotiations taking a long time, even as long as 10 years? Um, I think the process that... Uh, lies ahead for the UK now is a is a long one and I, again it's part of um, this whole thing that w w I, I don't think all of the implications are yet fully understood or appreciated um, you know if you take article 50 the you know the, the two-year period that's talked about around article 50 um, that is the two-year period for the UK exiting the EU uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, determine the new relationship between the UK and the EU. That will take goodness knows how many uh, years after that. You know, there presumably will require to be a transition period. Um, and then, you know, how long is a piece of string when it comes to, to considering the length of time it will take to put in place new trade deals between uh, the UK and not just the EU, but other countries. So I, I do think there is a real, uh, real risk that the UK is facing right now, a lost decade or, or more when the uncertainty and turmoil of Brexit and everything that comes after that before there is clarity about what the, the UK's place in Europe and the world actually is uh, will dominate and the damage that that will then do to our economy and you know other areas of our society and life will be deep and severe and that's why I'm so concerned about this and you know I the, the frustration I feel, and everybody should feel it right now, every time we hear somebody say, oh, well, you, you know, I, I've seen it on social media this morning about the, the unemployment figures. Uh, you know, unemployment's down. Uh, that shows that Brexit hasn't damaged the economy. Brexit hasn't happened yet. We're not even at the starting point uh, in terms of uh, the process that will see those implications start to hit home. So, you know, I think I'm not saying this just to 
to try to be, uh, you know, to depress everybody. But I think going into this, we've got to be really open-eyed. Uh, and nobody's doing anybody any favours by trying to suggest that we're through the worst. We haven't even started this process yet. And, you know, that potential for a, a lost decade for the UK, I think, should make us all sit up and take notice. And in Scotland, we should, it should make us think very carefully about whether there are better alternatives to just accepting that we have to be part of that. Thank you. Okay. Rachel. Good afternoon, First <coughs> Minister. I've got some very practical questions for you. I wondered um, how many extra civil servants have been recruited by Mike Russell, the new Brexit minister, and has there been a, a budget allocated to the new department? And thirdly, assuming that Mike Russell has a team in place, what discussions are taking place between his team and the UK government civil servants uh, to achieve our objectives? Um, well, I've already talked a lot about the discussions that are taking place between the Scottish Government officials and the UK Government officials, so I won't uh, go over all of that again unless there are particular elements of that you, you want me to go into in more detail. Um, we, Mike Russell has, uh, Karen is uh, the, the lead officials, one of the lead officials in Mike Russell's team and uh, there is a team of uh, officials. We are still, uh, as you would expect, because we are still trying to work out uh, exactly what the process with the UK government is going to look like, so we are still in the process of making sure that that team is fit for purpose. It will require to be flexible uh, as the, the demands of all of this become clearer. But the other point I would make is I think it would be wrong to look at uh, this in terms of just, I mean, there will be, there is, and there will continue to be a discrete team in the civil service in Scotland that supports the work that Mike Russell is doing and you know, the work that, that I'm doing and, and, and Fiona Hislop is doing on this. But this work really extends right across government. So our agriculture uh, officials, our, our fishing officials, our economy officials, our education officials are all, in addition to uh, all of their other responsibilities, centrally involved in trying to assess the implications for Scotland and develop the positions that we will then want to feed into uh, to the UK government. So although, yes, uh, and we will, I'm happy uh, we can provide uh, over the, the next period details of the numbers of civil servants and such like that are supporting Mike Russell, but I would just caution against However important that is, caution against thinking that that is the, the, the only impact on uh, our civil service of, of Brexit. It's going to uh, have an impact uh, pretty much. This is probably not a, much of an exaggeration to say it will have an impact on everybody working in the Scottish Government. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask there, um, in terms of the, um, the, the standing council, um, are you able to provide any more information on the work being undertaken by the standing council? And I know it's going to have things like subgroups, will they be able to update the committee on the work that they are doing? Yep, um, I'm, I'm very keen for the committee to be very you know, closely updated on the work of the Standing Council. There has been two meetings of the, in plenary session so far. I think the, the, the minute of the note of the first meeting has already been published and the note of the second meeting will be published uh, shortly. Um, the, there, there are a number of sub uh, strands to, to the work. So, uh, you know, one looking at the, the, the different options that might be open to Scotland, uh, one looking at, you know, education, at uh, particular economic impacts, and we'll, you know, make sure that there is. I wrote to the committee last week just uh, with some early thoughts on how we keep the committee updated. I'd be very keen to hear the committee's views and, and what flow of information and what form of information would be helpful. Um, in terms of, if I can focus on the options work uh, so far, I should say, and I'm, I know the committee will understand this, you know, we are constrained to some extent in the development of different options for Scotland before we know what options the UK government is going to try to achieve. But notwithstanding that, we are trying to get as prepared as possible. So there is work uh, being undertaken by the Standing Council looking a, a spectrum of options that, you know, if I can summarise, you know, go from how we protect different aspects of our relationship with the European Union, you know, Horizon 2020, uh, Erasmus, uh, for example, right, Europol, right through to what I would describe as more um, holistic and wholesale uh, solutions where Scotland would have uh, a much more uh, different relationship to the European Union or the single market than the UK as a whole. So that works in its early stage by definition because of the, uh, the, the position of the UK government just now, that's at an early stage, but, and there's a lot of detail behind that work, but as that develops, uh, I'm, I'm very keen that we have a, a working arrangement with the committee that allows you to be kept uh, appraised of that work and be able to engage with it as well. Excellent, thank you. I'll bring in Stuart McMillan now. Yeah, uh, thank you. 
Good uh, First Minister, uh, in the last parliamentary session, uh, after the referendum, we went through the devolution uh, for the Powers Committee and the process uh, for the Scotland Act 2016. And one of the issues uh, that was quite key uh, to that whole, uh, that whole debate was the issue of intergovernmental relations. Uh, in terms of that experience, uh, for going through that particular piece of legislation, uh, how have the Scottish Government actually used that, uh, that discussion, that debate, uh, at the time of IGR to help uh, fashion your discussions with the UK Government now? Well, there is a, 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 a well-developed uh, system of intergovernmental relations. You know, they're, they're not perfect, and you rightly say that uh, the work of the the, the Smith Commission and, and after the Smith Commission uh, was all about trying to strengthen those. But, you know, in short, the intergovernmental work uh, uh, operates through the Joint Ministerial Council in, in plenary session, but also uh, there is a, a Joint Ministerial uh, Committee that deals with Europe. It's long-standing. It's not uh, dealing with Brexit Europe issues. It deals with the, the ongoing business of, uh, of the European Union. Um, and there's a, another uh, subcommittee that deals with, with domestic issues. Uh, what I think is, is essential is that we have something additional to all of that to deal with the particular negotiations um, around Brexit. And that's what we are in the process of trying to finalise at the moment. But, you know, the, the experience of intergovernmental working, the, the strengths and the weaknesses of it, I think, are uh, useful to try to devise a a process here that is going to be meaningful and is going to be able to cope with a, you know, a set of discussions that are much more complex than those that we have uh, had to deal with prior to now. Um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of Article 50, uh, what do you think the process should be for actually triggering Article 50? And who do you think should be involved? Uh, I mean, this goes back to the, the question the convener asked me earlier on, I, and I was just stating an opinion about the the, the legal actions and the Lords Committee report. I, I think the argument that the House of Commons should be involved in the decision to trigger Article 50 is, is a compelling one. Now, the UK government's taken a different view and we'll see where that, that argument uh, goes. If that happens, then it does bring to bear the LCM question very centrally, which is why we're obviously keeping a close eye on, on the court cases, as I've said. But regardless of all of that, you know, it just seems to me, given the nature of what we're talking about here and, you know, adding into that the different way in which Scotland and indeed Northern Ireland voted, that, you know, there must be a central role for the Scottish Government in decision making here. So not just to be consulted, but actually to have a role in decision making. Um, you know, I think I've mentioned this already, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but after the last British Irish Council, Carmen Jones uh, said that he thought there should be uh, a role for all of the parliaments in the UK to actually uh, agree the position before Article 50 is triggered. Now, I think that's something that we uh, should, that's a, a position that I think should be seriously considered because we're all affected by this. And, uh, you know, if the Prime Minister's words uh, when she came to Edinburgh uh, are to be given real meaning in practice, then it strikes me that some kind of arrangement like that or a, a, a multilateral process that involves us in the actual decision is essential. And that's still you know, part of what we're seeking to work our way through. Well, thank you. And uh, finally, uh, First Minister, how optimistic are you that, uh, that the, the acquired rights of EU citizens uh, living in the UK and also UK citizens living in the EU will actually be protected post-Brexit? I'm sorry to say I'm not optimistic. I mean, I... I, I can't, um, the, the name of the particular expert is going to escape me just now, but somebody who was given evidence at uh, a committee uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Alan uh, von Low QC, uh, who, and you know, this is only an opinion, so, and I should say I hope he's wrong when he said this, but he described the chances uh, of uh, EU citizens uh, here retaining all of their rights as zero. Um, now, I, I hope that is wrong. Uh, but it's one of these areas where until we start getting answers from the UK government and what the position actually is, nobody can answer that with, with any certainty. And of course, it doesn't just apply to EU citizens here, or non-UK EU citizens here. We are all still EU citizens. Um, but it applies to UK citizens living in other EU countries. And I, you know, I, I've said this before, I think it is absolutely shameful and, you know, disgraceful that these questions which affect people's lives and livelihoods, their families, their careers, have not even started to be answered. 
Um, and of course, there is the other related uh, question, and it's, it's not the same, but it's related about our ability to travel. Uh, you know, we heard at the weekend, uh, although some of us tried to uh, make this point during the referendum, you know, it's only now that we're starting to hear this and the Home Secretary conceding that, you know, it is entirely possible that we'll all have to apply for visas to travel to other EU countries. I mean, these are just utterly, utterly depressing uh, things to be contemplating in this day and age when we've all enjoyed free travel across the, the European Union for as long as, as we have. But absolutely essential is to give people who've made their lives here, you know, who've done us the honour of coming to live in and contribute to our country, we owe them uh, some certainty. And, you know, I would call again today on the UK government and the Prime Minister to start providing that certainty. Thank you. Uh, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. Firstly, can I just ask uh, you, First Minister, about um, an answer you gave to Jackson Carlo, and, in which you said, and I absolutely take your point, that there were no inhibitions on any discussions with Europe at this time in the lack or in the complete absence of any, e, uh, any uh, UK position. I think that's an entirely fair point. But would you accept in that context that there are other uh, EU member states who have profound concerns about Scottish independence because of their own internal political dimensions? Uh, absolutely, of course. That. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going... The, the, the discussions I'm having uh, across Europe just now that we're having are not about... Scottish independence per se, they're about how Scotland can best protect our place in, in Europe. It's, it's a very different discussion. So, of course, I accept there's a range of different views. And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I always try to do, which uh, actually one uh, particular uh, person I've, I've spoken to in Europe in the last few weeks, who I won't name, but who said to me is what the UK government never tries to do is put itself in the shoes of other European countries. Uh, you know, the UK government always decides what it thinks is right for the UK and then expects everybody else to fall in line. Whereas, you know, actually we're dealing with a, a range of different countries. So, of course, I'm uh, very aware of the different views. But, you know, I'm here in a position where I didn't ask to be in. I didn't want to be in. Uh, we're taking a case to other interests across the European Union that say, says, you know, actually, it's probably quite good for the European Union as well as for Scotland that we try to work out how we protect these relationships rather than have a situation uh, where, you know, we're all wanting to, to leave and, and rip them up. So I think it's because of that that the, uh, the mood music around it is, is quite warm. I don't underestimate the challenges or the difficulties we face in all of this. I've, I've said that from uh, the, first, uh, the first moments after the referendum. We face a, a really challenging period, but I've got a duty to try to, in all of what lies ahead of us, to try to protect Scotland's interests as best as I can. And I, I wouldn't deserve to be sitting in this seat right now if I wasn't determined to do that. Yeah, uh, that's very fair. I'm grateful for that. Can I just ask you one other question? Um, you answered, you gave me a perfectly straight answer to the to the issue of the fishing industry basically voting no uh, back earlier in the summer. Um, you mentioned earlier on that your civil servants are now doing assessment work in the domestic policy areas such as agriculture and fisheries and, and uh, the environment. Could I therefore take it on behalf of all those people who clearly do have profound concerns about um, just the continuation of a policy they think has failed over many, many years, uh, that your, your officials are working on that uh, so that that will not happen, so there won't just be a continuation of everything that they put up with over many decades, I, I would quickly hazard, not under any particular government. I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm acutely aware of the fact that although a, a very clear, substantial majority of people in Scotland who voted, voted to, to remain, there were a number of people who voted to leave, and, and that was for a variety of different reasons. Uh, there were particular sectors, and fishing is uh, the, the, probably the, the best example here, where there were some very you know, strong uh, and strongly expressed reasons, and we, will, and we are seeking to engage with those uh, so that notwithstanding that difference of opinion, we can ensure that in all of the work we do, we're seeking to represent their interests as well. I got a letter just yesterday from uh, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation making some of these points again, and Fergus Ewing uh, will continue to engage very closely with them, as he is doing with the farming community, to make sure that we try to, uh, as, as much as possible, put forward uh, a set of arguments in this process that lies ahead. It's about representing the interests of, of all of these different sectors that is our duty to, to represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, Richard, did you want to come back in, Richard Lockwood? <coughs> I was just going to ask the First Minister for her view on that, so she's partially answered the question from Tavish Scott, but does she agree it's very important that in the times ahead we do articulate all parties, the government, parliament, that believes in European membership, uh, the reform programme we'd like to see put in place in, in the future, given that there were 38% of the population voted to, to leave the, the EU? Absolutely. 
I, absolutely, I totally agree with that. One of the frustrations of the position I think we're in just now is that you know, what are very, very legitimate arguments about reform of the European Union kind of get lost because it's about in or out. Um, I've never been uh, somebody, I, I don't know anybody really, uh, who argues the case that the European Union is perfect. I, you know, I think there's you know, various things about the European Union that we should be working to reform. Uh, the difficulty now is that, that our ability to do that is compromised by this almost existential you know, debate we're having about whether uh, we're, we're in or out. But you know, I think it, as we develop our positions and as we engage with the different sectors, it's important we don't lose sight of that, that there, there are some sectors that, that want to see uh, real change in how Europe does certain things, and that as we make our arguments and put our case forward, we don't forget that and don't lose sight of that. And can I just finish with one brief question, which is that... Up if and when Brexit happens, we're still a member of the EU, and given there's unlikely to be a lot of goodwill during on no ongoing negotiations over fishing, farming, environments, is there not a case for Scotland to ask for a greater role in those negotiations, given we do have goodwill amongst other member states? and given that mm. we may have a long-term interest in the outcome of these negotiations. Well, I'm just uh, glancing around this table, and I think I can probably safely say that you're the, the person around this table with most direct experience of uh, European uh, negotiations, and you know from that experience how much goodwill there is, but you know how much more difficult this current situation makes things. But yes, I think you're right. I think as, as we go through this period, uh, particularly when Article 50 is, is triggered, and, and there's a, a couple of years, if that's what it is, of, of initial negotiations, then our ongoing interests in the European Union are, are not lost sight of. And you know, I think an even greater role for Scotland in some of those council discussions and, and other uh, negotiations that take place is a very strong case for that. Very much. Um, if I could actually just come in and supplementary on that, since we were discussing fishing, obviously the Norwegian uh, uh, position has been arrived at through EFTA EEA uh, in, in part to protect their fishing rights. Um, but in terms of that example, the EFTA EEA example, as far as I can see through our discussions in Brussels and elsewhere, is the only example of a non EU member you know, being in uh, the single market. Now, the Prime Minister, notwithstanding we don't know what the UK government's position is, quite recently she basically set, ruled out the EFTA EEA position by saying this isn't, we're not going for. Yes, I mean, possibly, quite possibly. I just wonder what your reaction was to I, that. I, I don't know for sure that EEA EFTA membership is ruled out. I certainly hope not. I mean, I, you know, let me just be quite simple about this. I think EU membership is the best uh, relationship for all the you know, imperfections that we've talked about, I think being in as a full member, because that avoids you being subject to all the rules of the single market without having any ability to influence them. Uh, but if you're asking me what the second best option is, then I think it would be to be within that EEA uh, type relationship, because that secures membership of the single market. It doesn't secure membership of the customs union, so it's not it's not perfect. It also puts you in the position of having less influence over the rules of, of the single market. Uh, but nevertheless, and you know, you only have to read, uh, for example, the IFS report that, that takes you through, you know, some of the or tries to quantify in economic terms what some of the differences between uh, these different types of relationship would be. And you know, I think you know, we've got to understand, people talk about access to the single market. Any country can have access to the single market. It comes down to the agreement you have about what the terms of that access are. Access on the basis of a free trade agreement is not the same thing as membership. You know, a free trade agreement giving you access, you know, presumably that's principally about, you know, taking tariffs away from, uh, from the export and import of, of goods. You know, what does it mean for services? What does it mean for the, the whole array of non-tariff barriers to trade, license and regulation. Uh, you know, these are all things that if you're outside the single market seeking just access to it, become you know, all on the table and, and up in the air, if it's possible to be on the table and up in the air at the same time, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so I think we've got to get very clear about the difference between membership of the single market and just seeking access to the single market. Those two terms are used interchangeably at the moment, and it's completely wrong to use them interchangeably. Thanks very much, Lewis. Yes, just to follow up really the last couple of answers, if, if, if indeed, uh, on looking ahead a little and to the end of the process that you've described uh, already uh, today, 
if, if we get to a position where the bilateral and multilateral discussions produce a UK government approach to the negotiations that supports membership of the single market rather than simply access, uh, and Scotland has a, a greater role in discussions in the Council, for instance, in the way you've described, does that mean at that point that the Scottish Government uh, signs up to the proposition of British exit from the European Union, but on the basis that these are the terms on which that exit will happen, and, 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 and how then uh, do you engage in that negotiation you're, at that stage? You're, for very understandable reasons, trying to take me to the end of a process that sure. we've not started yet, and I'm, I'm going to resist doing that for very good reasons. Um, I want us to stay in the European Union, and I don't want to lose sight of that. That's not just what I think is in our best interest, it's what Scotland uh, voted for. Uh, but I recognise we are where we are in all of this, and therefore uh, we've got to, to look at what the least worst options are. And there's no doubt in my mind that the least worst option is remaining within the single market. Uh, I don't think it's as good an option, uh, which is why I'm not describing it as the best option, but it is the least worst option. And that's why I've put such a, a stress on that. Now, the reason I'm not going to take myself to the end of the process is because I think you know, notwithstanding everything I've said and stand by about the lack of any real answers or detail from the UK government, if you're to read, try to read the smoke signals, all of them would say that's not where the UK government is going to head, that they're going to head to a position that is outside the single market seeking access. Um, and that's why I think it's premature to say that I think we'll get to the position you've outlined, but we'll be trying to do that you have with them will be intended to persuade them to take that route? Yeah, I mean, when I talk about the options we're exploring, it, you know, the, there may come a point where not all of these options can be uh, explored in parallel. But, you know, when I talk about trying to get the UK government into the least worst option, looking at differential options for Scotland to retain our relationship with Europe, uh, making sure the independence option, these are all uh, options that we will continue to, to pursue in, in parallel. Uh, to protect our interests and make sure that we are keeping as many options on the table to protect our interests as we can. Now, we'll get to a stage where uh, some of those options, you know, for a, one reason or another, another, fall off the table. Uh, but at, f at the moment, and for as long as possible, given the complexity and the likely timescale of this process, keeping as many options on the table to best protect our interests for as long as possible is the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just in conclusion, First Minister, I realise that we're just um, on time and we we're supposed to finish at half past one. Um, can I ask you, a number of witnesses to this committee and also outside have s talked about the opportunities for Scotland if the rest of the UK exits and Scotland remains uh, within the EU, either as part of the UK through some differential agreement or through independence. Are these opportunities, uh, which were raised by Virgin Money and others in, in this committee, are these things that, that are, in your mind, something that we should be exploring? Yeah, you know, I'm, you've, you've always got to look to take the good out of any bad situation you're in. Of, co of course you do. But, you know, I'm yet to be convinced that the, the good opportunities that come from this situation will come anywhere close to out, uh, outweighing the, the real downsides and, and therefore you know while I know there'll be a whole variety of reasons why some people you know, notwithstanding what they said before the referendum now say oh well we just have to shrug our shoulders and go on with it I think the implications of this for us are so potentially uh, damaging across a whole range of different areas that you know we shouldn't give up the fight and we should you know try as to do what I've been talking about is protect those interests now does that mean you know I, I won't always try to, to take you know, the silver linings or put the silver linings on, of course we will. But, you know, let's be clear here that the, the downside of this decision, in my view, massively outweighs any potential uh, so-called opportunities that arise from it. Thank you very much, First Minister, and thank you for coming to speak thank to you. us today. Thank you. We'll have a brief suspension before we go into private session.